This is a tool that is to be used and it is up to the speaker to use it for good or evil. I think I use the example in the class of, of a hammer, right? You use hammer to build a, someone a house, but you can also use a hammer to murder someone as well, right? Persuasion, same way, maybe less extreme, but maybe not. Maybe these individuals start out as narcissists and as they gain more and more power and they take more and more advantage, it's something that builds over time. When you feed a narcissist, they, they don't go away. They just get bigger. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this week's episode of Good People. Today, I was joined by Dr. Lindsay Harville Bowman. She is an associate professor at James Madison University and studies and teaches both communications and existential psychology. This conversation is going to be divided into two parts. Today, we talk about her work in communications. More specifically, we talked about persuasion and cults. Next week's episode, we talk about her work with existential psychology, death anxiety, suicidality, and her work with the Terror Management Lab. Before we begin, due to the topics of our conversation, if you or someone you know are experiencing a mental health emergency, suicidal thoughts, or anything similar, support is available 24-7 through the 988 Suicide and Crisis Lifeline. Call 988. There will also be resources available in the show notes if you need them. As always, I hope you guys enjoy this week's episode. Welcome to the show. Thank you for taking part in this immersive listening experience. A meaningful existence is a moving target that no matter how close, will always be out of reach. We hope this message finds you with an outstretched hand. As we attempt to uncover complex truths, remember, life's toughest questions can be answered if we all just focus on one thing. Being good people. Dr. Lindsay Harville Bowman, thank you for doing this. I'm very excited to have this conversation. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Before we get started, this is going to be a fun, like, two parter for people who are listening. Uh, you study a whole bunch of different things, but I mean, they are related in many, many ways, and there's kind of this one focal point. Um, but for those listening, would you please give them a brief overview of who you are, some of the stuff that you're interested in, um, in your areas of expertise? Sure. So my name is Lindsay Harvell Bowman. I'm an associate professor in the School of Communication Studies at James Madison University. Uh, I hold an affiliate ship in the Department of Psychology uh, here at JMU, and I am also an adjunct faculty member in the Furkoff School of Graduate Psychology at Yeshiva University. So my area of expertise lies in communication and existential psychology. So I focus a lot on death and suicide and um, kind of how do we become, how do we make meaning in our life through that? How do we communicate that through advocacy and things of that nature, um, things I'm interested in. Taylor Swift takes up a significant portion of my life and money, um, which is great. I wouldn't have it any other way. And then uh, I also am a pound fitness instructor. So uh, that is cardio drumming. So that's what I do in my spare time. <laughs> Very cool. How many times did you see Taylor Swift on her recent tour? <laughs> So I actually only saw her once and it was, it was quite the process of even getting tickets. I got the tickets in the pre-sale. I was in the gigantic war uh, that everyone else was. I was at James Madison. I went downstairs to get food. When Ticketmaster crashed, there were women crying in the lobby of the building. It was very dramatic, um, but was able to get tickets. Thanks to a code from someone uh, in my laboratory who has now graduated and it's a friend and her name's Emma and I was in Philly. So I went to Philly and it was the best night of my life, maybe even better than my wedding. I don't know. Still trying to decide. <laughs> it's definitely up there among the top two. It's, it's there. It's there. It's there. When I was in, I was in Chicago a couple weeks or I guess a couple months ago back at this point, I didn't see this, but I was rooming with this other guy we were there for the weekend for this uh, fitness coaching conference and he told me in the morning that he saw fireworks uh, over by the lake we were staying in rosemont which is just outside chicago and he looked it up in the morning and it was the taylor swift concert so he claims that he saw taylor swift in chicago i didn't see it but from the hotel room you could well there were fireworks yeah <laughs> there were i'm they, sure the show experience exist. 
would have been much different. I'm not a huge Taylor Swift fan, but I have heard that, I mean, outside of whatever you think of Taylor Swift, it is an amazing performance. The fact that she can even do that for three and a half hours is amazing. Like, I need to know what she eats. I need to know her fitness routine. I mean, what, how does she do that? Yeah. How is she it's, that it, in shape? It's amazing. It's on par with Kanye's like speeches that he would give for hours at, <laughs> at his. It's a little bit different. <laughs> I would say hers is probably more impressive and less crazy, but same level of fitness. Yes. <laughs> How did you get interested and involved with research on death, death anxiety, suicidality, things like that? Yeah, so I was, when I was at the University of Oklahoma, my PhD is in social influence, which um, is a branch of social psychology, but I was doing inoculation work with Michael Fowl, who was known for inoculation. That is a theory that talks about the, protect, the protection against counter arguments. And unfortunately, two years into my program, he suddenly came down with cancer and died within like six months. So at the same time, I was learning about terror management theory and existential psychology in a class that I was taking in my doctorate program in psychology um, and was just decided, you know what, right time, right place kind of changed the way that I viewed the world and did a 180 and started studying death. The suicide piece came later. Um, I was interested in a theoretical component of kind of, if everyone has a fear of death, then how do people who attempt suicide get around that, right? Or even complete suicide. So I started down this track from a theoretical component paired up with my colleague, Ken Critchfield, who is um, at Yeshiva now. And we've kind of found some very interesting things and have gone down this um, rabbit hole of suicidality and kind of meaning of life and developing new therapy techniques, but also looking at it from an advocacy perspective on the other end. Uh, Ken is a licensed clinician, so he, that enables us to do this safely. So that's kind of how I got involved in it randomly yeah <laughs> not intentionally I, th I think that's cool like one of the ways i think sometimes your life works out is just things happen to you and there you are you know and then you go down that path and then as you get older and you do it it narrows sort of the avenues that you can take and then you just kind of keep following that hole that's what i've noticed i'm still very young and i have many paths before me that i could follow but i'm sort of sure. seeing that that's how it's trending yeah, absolutely. I love the way that my life looks now, although it was really random how we got here. And even, even joining fac the faculty at Yeshiva was, was kind of random as well. And so I feel like I am in this really kind of different interdisciplinary world where I'm working in both worlds, but it's, it seems to work and we're managing it well. And I get to work with communication students. I get to work with psychology students. It's great. <laughs> yeah. How did you uh, sort of focus on communications as a, as a byproduct of that as well? Yeah. So my degree was granted out of a communication department. And so my undergraduate degree is in communication and my master's degree is in communication. Um, my PhD is in social influence. So social influence is a branch of social psychology and social influence focuses on just that, the influence of others and, and how being around other people influences your behaviors, both um, individually, but also in whatever context that you're in. And so, um, you know, I was always interested in the way that we interact with each other, which in and of itself is social psychology, but in communication, as you know, as a communication person, a grad, right? Like, you know, that um, we take messages and, and, and really kind of look at how, the media and, and how that influences people as well, maybe to a different, not that social psychologists don't, but do it at a, maybe a little different level. Yeah, it's real, that. right? Like, um, I think about this often. I'm in a career in fitness now. I've always been passionate about fitness since high school. I didn't go to college planning on pursuing what I'm doing now. But the reason why I did communications, number one, be was because 
at a certain point I had done enough communications that it just made more sense to graduate. Right. But, Mm -hmm. um, in reality it was because no matter what I wanted to do, I knew that this was something that I struggled with when I think about the person that I was when I was in high school, I didn't think, I, I don't think I had a hard time communicating with people necessarily, but speaking in front of others and just being performative in that way, that was something that I admired from a lot of people. I really admire people that can be before others and speak well. And so it was a avenue that I wanted to at least find out if it was something that I was capable of doing. This podcast is that, right? It's a way for me to practice talking, essentially. And I give a great deal of thought to how I can get better at it. And I'm probably harder on myself than anybody is on the quality of how this turns out. But it's something that I... It's always like a back burner passion, right? No matter what I do, communications is always going to be there or the way that I communicate will always be there. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's why, you know, we require everybody and most universities do require everyone to have some kind of public speaking class. Although while I get up in front of people all the time, it's terrifying every single time. (laughs) And most of the time, I just, you know, I just don't take myself too seriously. And when we go from there, whether that be a big speech in front of every, like a ton of people or just a, you know, just a classroom lecture. But um, yeah, I think that's the one thing about communication majors. Obviously I work with communication and psychology students and I see there is a lot more polish at a younger age right with communication because it's ingrained in every single class so. mm. i to that note did a podcast with my best friend ever like i've known this guy since i was six years old he's coaching for a soccer team uh, at a college that he's a graduate assistant at and i was dripping sweat nervous the whole time i was talking to him like i've, I've known him forever i it's so easy for me to talk to him but still When it's performative, quote unquote, I use that term very loosely, knowing that people are going to listen to us talk. I'm like very aware of that at all times. Yeah, I, you know, media interviews, I think, are the worst for me. Do I do them all the time? Yeah, yeah, I do. Um, And they're they're like nails on a chalkboard to me. I would rather do anything else. And I would put any of my graduate students up in front of the media before me any day. But, you know, I mean, it's it's a need <laughs> so we do it but it is it is and I, and I go back and I watch it much like you and I am very very hard on myself <laughs> I usually watch it in the fetal position it's it's humorous <laughs> and sad at the same time <laughs> I know it's always a relief though for me when people say hey your podcast episode that you released last week was good and I'm like oh thank god yeah. like I've listened to it six <laughs> times and I there's 12 things that I thought I did wrong <laughs> Oh yeah, I'm a millennial, so I need I need people to tell me I did a good job all the time. <laughs> um, otherwise, I will sit and do the same thing. Yep, I think it was horrible. So <laughs> yeah. So this conversation, I want us to sort of revolve around two separate things. I really am excited to get into the death stuff uh, with you later on. But to start, let's talk about persuasion more specifically. Some aspects of communication, but. When I took your class, there was cult week. It was a week dedicated. It was a week, right? Or was it more? Yep. It's so a week. <laughs> it was a week dedicated to learning about cults, how they form, why people join them, um, sort of their, I use the term loosely, place in the world, right? Um, let's talk about that. Can you, first of all, just give us a definition of what persuasion is? Yeah, it's um, the intent to influence others, right? And it's very basic nature. Persuasion and social influence are very similar. Social influence focuses more on a group aspect of the influence, right? Looking to others. Uh, Persuasion can happen between two people, but it can happen between a number of people. You can be accidentally persuaded by just hearing a conversation. So you're trying to change someone's mind about something, essentially. I remember your teachings were very focused on this as a tool that is to be used and it is up to the speaker to use it for good or evil. What are some of the positives to persuasion? I have to commend you. You remember so much from this class. I told you my memory is good. (laughs) 
<laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, um, yeah, I, I think I use the example in the class of, of a hammer, right? You can use, and it's it's a morbid example, but it's an example nonetheless. You can use hammer to build a, someone a house, but you can also use a hammer to murder someone as well, right? Persuasion, same way, maybe less extreme, but maybe not, right? Like, um, and and obviously the cults that that's not persuasion, that's coercion, that's something different. But you have persuasion you know that intent the the that meaning behind what you're trying to do and the ethics plays into persuasion and whether it's manipulation or coercion or something else right and so it's a tool it's a tool that you can use for great things or not so great things you said uh manipulation coercion deception are there any other sort of terms to throw into that bunch of the negative sides of persuasion not that I can think of. I mean, the big ones I think that people think about the most is coercion and manipulation. And there's a thin, thin line. And religion obviously gets thrown in there. But, um, you know, that's a separate issue. But that line is thin. And it all comes back to intent and, and the ethics behind things. I actually had Dr. Jenny Rozier on the podcast a couple of weeks ago. And we oh, talked she's great. About- yeah, she's awesome. We talked about um, ro- romantic relationships, attachment theory, and she sort of used a similar um, analogy for this, which was that we're given tools when we're born, and it's generally whatever our parents have. And there's some good tools, and there's some not so good tools. And you know, she used the analogy of some people are born with a really beautiful toolbox that is flawless and it's big, and some people are born with a rackety old toolbox that doesn't have a lot of tools in it. And, you know, that sort of touches on the different circumstances and experiences that we'll all have throughout our life. So my question, and let me know if you need me to rephrase this, is is persuasion persuasion just one of the tools that is in those toolbox? Or would you say that persuasion itself is a toolbox and there are many tools within it that aid it? Oh, that's a good question. It may be both. Right. I mean, it's a tool in the larger. I mean, Jenny was talking about it more from a detachment perspective and kind of your rickety old toolbox would be, you know, a not so secure attachment style, if you will. Mm -hmm. But um, I, you know, as a tool in your general life toolbox, yes, but persuasion in itself has all of these different types of be like a toolbox within a toolbox, right? Okay. Um, persuasion in itself has so many different aspects to it and different strategies that you can use depending on the situation and the person that it very well could be seen as its own toolbox as well. I'm going to use that in class next time I teach persuasion. Thank you. <laughs> I'm glad that I had an influence on the... I, 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 will, I will cite you. <laughs> okay, thank you. Tell them to listen to my podcast. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, maybe a better way to put it would be persuasion is hammer. And like underneath persuasion is like rubber mallet. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know how many types of hammers there are. I'm not going to lie. Um, <laughs> Metal hammers. Yeah. You know, yeah. Jack Small hammer. Small hammers. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay. Very good. Um, with that being said, cults are very closely tied to persuasion. That's correct? Mm-hmm. Specifically, uh, the, some of the stuff that we talked about, coercion and deception. Um, but let's get started with what is a cult? Can we define that? That is a good – there's a lot of different definitions of cults, right? Um, there are different stages of cults that I cannot remember off the top of my head. But perhaps you can because you remember this stuff from class. But there's certain aspects that – that should be met in regards to cults. A a lot of that is, you know, the softening up stage and there's different stages. It doesn't just, you don't just wake up and go, ah, I'm in a cult today. Right. If that, that would never happen because people would not just join a cult. Right. And so cults, you know, they are generally, you're generally shut off from others that aren't in the group. Um, There's, a large level of conformity. And I'm not even sure that cult members consciously are aware of that conformity until they get out. But I mean, the, the big piece is that you are generally cut off 
from the outside, right? Maybe not at the beginning, but eventually you are um, in its more advanced stages. But the the complicated thing about the cult definition is that there's a lot of things that could be a cult that yeah, some people like certain religious groups, some people are a little, you know, not so apt to say that, that certain groups are cults, right? And so there's a, it's, it's a slippery, you know, it's a thin line between what's a cult, what's not, and somewhat subjective. Yeah. The reason why I wanted to ask that is because, so I'm a CrossFit coach. Okay. There's like a running joke that CrossFit is like a cult. There's a bunch of other things. Jiu Jitsu is like that. The Swifties too. The Swifties too. I mean, we're a cult. Yeah. You guys are <laughs> in a cult yourself. Do statements like that, although they're funny, have any merit to them? No, I mean, because I, you know, I'm, I'm not a part of the CrossFit crew, but I do, I do watch all the CrossFit games because it's just like phenomenal that people can do this. Um, and it's not me, uh, but I do have friends that do CrossFit. They still talk to us. Like they still talk to me, even though I'm not in CrossFit. Right. And Swifties, we still talk to other people. I mean, maybe not Jake Gyllenhaal fans or Kanye <laughs> Swift fans or Kanye Swift, <laughs> Kanye West fans. Gosh. Um, but you know, you still talk to others. So no, I think, I think it's a joke. And there's a lot of jokes, right? Like I have a, I have a shirt that says that has a Kool Aid man on it that says "Let's start a cult," right? I mean, it's it's funny, but it's also <laughs> probably could be damaging for people too if they were in a cult. So, <laughs> okay, so sort of a separating line there is kind of what you were talking about earlier of the like the group separation is a big aspect of it for sure. For me, yeah, that that's for sure. But there's a lot of religious groups out there, too, that in the back of my mind, I would never say publicly, and I'm not going to on this podcast, um, that I would put like, okay, well, they are kind of segregated from people, but um, calling it a cult would have them come after me. So we're not going to do that. <laughs> yeah, I know you've sort of said, and maybe this was the answer to it. And if it is, feel free to, you know, we can move on. But my question is how do cults form? I know there's this like stage mm -hmm. process of it, but is there anything specific that you can point to? Yeah. Vulnerability on regards to the person that they're recruiting. Right. So, and if you think about it, I, I hear this a lot. I hear this from my own mother. I hear this from a lot of people that are, I would never be in a cult. Right. And I hear this in, during cult week in class all the time, right? I would never be in a cult. That would never happen. And you have some people that are adamant against it, right? But the thing is, is the people that are in the cults, they don't, they would have said the same thing, right? What happened was something happened in their life that they were vulnerable, right? Maybe they were going through a divorce. Maybe their parents just died or, you know, even, you know, their dog died or something. Something happened. Their longtime boyfriend or girlfriend broke up with them. Something happened that made them vulnerable. And at that point, it is very easy for someone to swoop in and give you the answers to your problems, right? Um. And provide, you know, or maybe you're vulnerable because you just moved to a new place and you don't know people. The vulnerability doesn't have to be traumatic, but there is always that vulnerability that allows that, that person from the cult to step in or that group. Then they invite you. They seem like nice people. And it's a very slow process, right? They start testing you in regards to behaviors over time. It's not immediate. It can take years, right? If you look at Jonestown, right, they started out as this wonderful church, right? People's Temple, they had, you know, they were doing great things in regards to um, integrating blacks and whites. And it was just this wonderful intercultural, interracial thing. And it turned into, well, we all know where it went, right? Not so good. It didn't get there overnight. People didn't take the Kool-Aid mix overnight, right? Like it happened over time and they were extremely isolated. So this might be a question that is more focused on, I guess, the leadership side of a cult, but why exactly do they form? 
<laughs> There's a lot of people walking around with personality B characteristics <laughs> and narcissists. Um, yeah, I think, you know, there is this show on Netflix and I just saw it the other day and it's called um, How to Become a Cult Leader or something like that. Naturally, mm. I, I started watching it um, and it does. It lays out exactly kind of what you need to build a cult. It's a satire. I hope most people realize that by looking at other cults, right. And how they formed. And so these leaders, you know, always had something in their background in regards to psychology that they're not well, right. Um, whether it's, and most of them have personality B characteristics, right. Um, narcissism for sure. Um, and, and things of that nature, that's probably the most um, common, but probably, you know, probably borderline personality disorders, you know, all the fun things that happen with personality beef stuff. So, Ken, uh, my question is, you said these people aren't well, right? Is this like borderline clinically unwell? Like there's something seriously wrong with them or is this almost similar to how the cult itself is formed maybe these individuals start out as narcissists and as they gain more and more power and they take more and more advantage it's something that builds over time i don't know if you necessarily have the answer to that but it's a question i, I think don't yeah yeah it's a really good question to answer i am not a, clin a clinical psychologist so i wouldn't be able to even scratch a surface in making a claim about any of that um but you know, the, when you feed a narcissist, they they don't go away. They just get bigger, right? They need more. So um, I think that's all I could really say about that since I'm not a clinician. But I think some clinical psychologists probably would have a lot to say about it. Mm. Much more than I'm able to, unfortunately. Yeah. We, we've we talked about nar narcissism. Are there any other characteristics that you think is worth pointing out for leaders of of cults? I think that aspect of control, right? And control is something that we all want. It leads to our fear of death, right? Um, but that idea of being able to control um, not only makes you feel better as a person, but also, you know, um, gives you power, right? We all want control and power in life. Um, you, to survive, you need a fair amount of power and control, right? These people take it a step further where they want to control a whole bunch of people. And you see that with, um, you see that with people who, you know, crash a plane intentionally, like a pilot who takes a whole bunch of people with them. Why? Right. Um, or Marshall Applewhite, who was the leader of Heaven's Gate, he, there was some assumption that he was sick with cancer. And when he was sick was when the whole, um, the whole cult took a more death suicide approach, doomsday type approach. So, you know, you wonder if that control is a, a, what's the word I'm looking for, um, kind of healing mechanism for them or protection in some way. It's almost like a final hurrah in a way, in like a really yeah. twisted way, obviously. But um, if I'm going down, I'm bringing these people with me. Yeah, I think pilots that take plane fulls of people down are a different type of person, right? Um, to choose suicide in and of itself is... I think something that, you know, is a choice, but to take people with you, that's on a different level. And, and, you know, with MH370 still missing, you just, you don't know if that's what happened or if something else happened, you have no idea. But if that was what happened with that particular plane, that was particularly painful if the people were alive the whole time. So yeah, it's disturbing, but these, you know, individuals are out there. And I, I, I was trying, I was thinking the other day, have we, I, I can't think of a cult that we have right now that's out there 
that's going. I mean, other than, you know, if you start to think religious cults, but. Yeah. It kind of poses the question and is part of the natural progression of a cult to end in, for lack of a better way to put it, fire. It's there's always it feels a, like they all do. Right. Mm. I don't know that it, I don't know that it intend. I don't know that they intend it to go that way. But if you think about it, these people, how long can this person keep this facade up, right? If we think about Waco and the Branch Davidians and David Koresh, right? How long could he have done that, right? He had them isolate. I mean, isolating people is somewhat useful in getting them to buy in and, and not having outside influences. But Heaven's Gate allowed people to go in and out of the cult all the time. And so when you have that, you know, what kind of outside influences, and, and, and that's why Heaven's Gate so interesting is because people were leaving, but then they were coming back um, because of the world. And so there always seems to be a common enemy with these cults, right? With Heaven's Gate, it was the media, it was the government, it was a lot of things, the world in general. Jonestown was you know, um, the world Congress, like once a congressman came out, it went downhill from there. Um, I'm trying to think of some others. Oh, oh, Branch Davidians for sure, the government, right? So, I mean, there's always a common enemy and I think it leads them in that direction. Yeah. I'm sure that's the natural progression of it, right? It's in order to get the buy-in or the, you know, you're on our side, it has to be a very much, we're against these people mentality. And when that, these people that we're against is the rest of the world, inevitably something will go wrong. Waco's it's very a great us example. versus them. Yeah. Waco is a good example, but then we had Nexium. Nexium. Is that who? Ne ne I'm not familiar Nexium. with that one. Nexium. That's also a pill that you take. So maybe it's not that, but it was, um, there was a, oh, what is her name? It was a Disney star that was in this cult and they had branded each other and it was like a sex cult <laughs> and um, they're all in jail now. So, you know, they caught them in Mexico. So nobody died in that one, but that was, I don't know what that one was. That, that, that was, I don't know what their common enemy was. That was a strange one, but yeah, so often, you know, when I lived in Utah, I, there was some fear that when Warren Jeffs was put away, which was the leader of the fundamentalist Latter-day Saints, the FLDS, there was some concern that if they ever found out that he was never coming out of jail, that there might be a mass suicide or that he would direct them from prison to do that. Um, they haven't yet, but there was some concern, you know, a decade ago that that was going to happen. So. I watched that documentary on Netflix about Warren Jeffs and the FLDS. Yeah. Is that still an ongoing thing? Like, is he still leading yes. those people from prison? Very much so. Wow. Very much so. Um, yeah. And, you know, I mean, it comes back to the isolation. They are very isolated. Now they do, they do go out in public. I remember seeing them often. Um, they, they go to Walmart, they go to Costco, they often go in groups. Um, but many of them try to escape, right? And that was a very common thing. I lived just 30 minutes north of where they were located. So often they would escape to, you know, my town or even further. My town was a little too close, but we still saw them. Now they're kind of, they're kind of spreading out around Utah and Arizona. So they're not necessarily on kind of their compound where they were. Some of them still are, but they're really kind of spreading out and that's due to a lot of issues, but he is still very much in control, very. which is sad. Yeah. One of my questions now is characteristics of the people that follow cults. I know we talked about joining at times of vulnerability, but are there any specific characteristics that people have sort of, um, What's the term I'm looking for underlying that make them more susceptible to join the cult? I think it would be really easy to generalize here. Right. And I think people could look and I think that's where we get people like, yeah, I'm not one of those people. I'm the person that always speaks out. You know, I, that would never happen to me. 
I would argue, no, there's not a specific characteristic. I think it all depends on vulnerability, time, place, where you're at. And if that person meets your needs at that time, right? If you're, I mean, if you think about a time when you've been in a really dark place, right? And you're searching for meaning or you're searching for something to feel better, right? Some people go to drugs, some people go to alcohol, some people go to exercise. Some people meet new people and they end up in a cult. Any of us could do it. Any of us. I remember this was on persuasion specifically, I think, that people who are dogmatic are more susceptible. Was that for persuasion or was that to join a cult? That might have been persuasion. I really hate to put a specific, I mean, I'm sure there, there, there's research out there. It's just, I think it's really naive to put specific characteristics because what's going to happen is people are going to go for a witch hunt for these uh-huh. people. And it's just not like that. It, it can happen to any of us, which I know is not the most interesting answer, but I think, I mean, there's a lot of variability. It, it actually probably makes people quite uncomfortable because it could be any of us. Me too, right? I don't think I could be in a cult, but maybe. I spent a yeah. lot of money on Taylor Swift tickets. <laughs> I was just about to say, I think it's a great answer just because when we talked initially with career paths and that sort of thing, you know, it would be silly for me to assume. I always say this it's silly for me to assume where I'm going to be in five years from now, right? I don't know what decision I'm going to make now that's going to impact my career, my life. I don't know, maybe potentially tragic things could happen to me and my family that leave me alone and stranded and I need a cult to bring me back from it. So I think I mean you a, don't think of it like that, right? Like exactly. you're not thinking it's a cult, but yeah. A new yeah, group. It's a, it's a community that cares about me. Exactly. Yeah. Ish. In your yeah. mind they care about you. <laughs> is there is there any more notable so we talked about Jonestown, Waco, uh, Heaven's Gate. Are there any other notable cults, I say, that are worth looking into, but that are interesting and fascinating to you? Um, Charles Manson. You know, I think a lot of people might not consider him a cult, but these women killed for him. That's fascinating. He didn't kill anybody. I mean, he did through these women, right? But these women killed for him. That's always been incredibly fascinating to me. Um, I think you have um, groups of people, right? Like I think as soon as you isolate people. So if you isolate people, the FLDS would be in that group, right? And I think a lot of people consider the FLDS a cult. They would not, right? But certainly people in Utah do. And and I think after all the stuff, especially stuff on Netflix that came out, I think now people are well aware of what's going on. Um, uh, I am skeptical to say this because this church comes after you. But Scientology as well, maybe. I think some people have considered them a bit cultish, right? The weird thing is if you look at the checklist, and I say this as a religious person, most religions can fall into that checklist. So for me personally, you know, I'm part of the Presbyterian USA church, you know, we're encouraged to question things. I think if you're in a church that doesn't encourage you to question things or doesn't allow that, then you might want to look at your choice there. That's my own personal opinion, but I'm trying to think of some others. I mean, there's some great, um, there's a show on A&E called Cults and Some Kind of Beliefs. And, and that goes into a lot. There was a a cult that was a Korean cult. There were guns. It was interesting. Um, and then there were some cults in the 70s that didn't get a ton of, um, like a ton of attention, but they're super interesting. Just go like on Netflix or Hulu and type in cults and there's stuff to watch. What can we learn from cults? What is a, a valuable lesson that we can take away from sort of them existing? 
how easily humans conform. I think it's frightening, right? You get a group of people together that share the same interest and they will conform. Um, and if you think about humanity and survival and meaning, if the wrong person is leading that group of people, that's frightening. So from an existential perspective, I think we can learn a lot from cults by just watching how people conform, how people were so willing to take their own lives with Heaven's Gate. I mean, gosh, they made exit interviews that you can go watch on YouTube. It's fascinating. Not even, I mean, happy about it. It's fascinating. You mentioned this a bit when you were talking about religion, when you said that if it's a good idea to question your religion or group that you're within, if they don't allow you to ask questions, um, you just gave that answer of humans are super easy to conform. Mm -hmm. Are there any other things that you would say people should look out for? And we can sort of open this up broadly to persuasion as a whole, not just you know, because I think that that's probably a more imminent danger for people is the threat of persuasion at a small level, you know, all the way up to obviously joining a cult. That would probably be the extreme of it. But what yeah. sort of elements of persuasion should people look out for to avoid being coerced or any of those negative aspects of persuasion as a tool? I think a really easy way is is and it's a subjective way it's it, it goes kind of about, along what you perceive but if you perceive that your freedoms are being limited you need to step away right they might not be doing that but if you perceive even just a feeling that you're like you know what i feel like i'm getting forced into a choice and i feel like I, there's not a choice to make and sometimes people are super tricky about it where they'll give you two choices but obviously you can't choose. So Jonestown is a perfect example, right? He's like, yeah, sure. You can walk out. You don't have to drink the Kool-Aid walk out. But then what he didn't tell you is that you'd be shot, right? So it's like, what choice do you, you don't really have any choice, right? So I think at that point, and there's lots of situations where you have these two options, but they're not really a choice, right? You're getting, because you, if you choose this one, you're dead or you're fired or something, Right. So anytime that a group and, and, you know, organizations are really great at this too, pushing you in to an option, right? I think that is something to watch for and ethics, right? There are some unethical people in this world. Um, and I think that being aware of your own ethics and your own morals and your own values and what's right and wrong will help you go forth and question everything. That's kind of been a common thing that I've talked to people on here about in general, which is cool that it, it sort of just keeps coming up is that values are sort of this foundation that every single individual needs. And, you know, I work with people on their values specifically, like for, for some of my clients, I literally sit down with them for like an hour and I like interview them pretty much to uncover these fundamental things that they believe because the way that I look at it, values are the compass for our decision-making. And so very much with what you're saying, if I value being a kind person that perseveres through challenge, you know, if I'm ever in a situation where I have that uneasy feeling and I'm put into this ultimatum sort of situation and I just don't feel right about it, I can use that as like a, okay, I trust that instinct. This is going to be a tough couple weeks for me to get over this thing, but I know I can, cause that's what my values are. So it's, it's cool that you bring that up. Yeah. I, I think it's, and it's subjective, right? And I also try not to judge other people on their values because it's based on how they grew up and what's happened in their lives. And so what might be fine for you might not be fine for me and vice versa. Right. So it's just kind of trying to navigate that. Now, with that being said, I also run the institutional review board here at James Madison, which means all the human subjects research comes through us and my board of, of people. So we make sure that that's ethically done. Um, so ethics are always kind of on my mind. Um, but we all have 
things that guide us every day. It's funny. I, I found recently, I've been giving a lot of thought to this. When I am in a disagreement with somebody about something, it's generally after I've removed myself from the situation and there's not a, say I'm talking to a client and they just aren't adhering to the thing that I'm asking them to, to help them with the thing they told me they want to accomplish. Anytime I reflect on it, I'm like, oh, they just like, don't actually value that. They might say they want something, but they don't actually value the thing that they're talking about, which is totally fine. And it's, you know, that obviously what, what argument is there to even have if something that I always say is that, you know, don't, don't do anything that you want to do. And also make sure you know what you want to do. Because a lot of times we just sort of do these things arbitrarily and we have no direction because we've never really contemplated or sat down and written out the things that we want. I mean, actions speak louder than words, right? If you want to run every day, you will make time for it, right? Um, if you want to exercise or you want to lift, right? I mean, I have a, a fitness regimen that I follow, Um and obviously I teach these exercise classes, but a lot of it is so that I can do that, right? And be able to do that and be in shape. But nobody's too busy. Nobody, you know, it's just making the time, right? Like manage your time in a way. And so whenever someone says, I'm too busy for that, I'm like noted, right? Just be honest. It's cool. <laughs> I'm fine with that. Like I'm not a priority and that's okay. Because not that's not the case all the time. So. Yeah. I feel like jujitsu is like that for me. I, I do jujitsu as one of my hobbies and I was just talking to a friend of mine and anytime I go in there, I feel guilty now because for whatever <laughs> reason, everybody that goes there is that's their thing. They love it. They do it four or five times a week. And I'm just not like that. I like jujitsu, but I like it when I go to, sometimes three times a week. And I bet there's mm -hmm. probably going to be a point in my life when I want to go every single day and I, I'm willing to do that. But I don't know. It's this weird thing that I have inside me that I really need to get over because it's like, objectively speaking, when I'm having this conversation, I am totally okay with only going to jujitsu twice a week. But then when I go and I start getting beat up by people that used to not be as good as me, but they just spent more time doing it now, it's frustrating. And I'm like, oh, I should do this more. And then... I start doing the other stuff that I like to do less and then I get upset and I don't know why that's sort of the thing we're talking about. Yeah. I mean, I think just doing whatever, you know, I think, and I think COVID helps with people too. Hopefully uh, now that we're sort of getting back to normal, but I think people started to realize like, I'm not going to do this that I don't like, why am I doing this? Right. And I've been really good, like over the past year, as I've just kind of been working on myself and reflecting on things and trying to make a space where I'm truly happy and have meaning and kind of build the life that I need. Um, I don't do things that I don't want to do. <laughs> right. Like if I'm like my pastors would, would laugh, but like, if I don't want to go to church on Sunday, I'm, but I will tell you, I still feel guilty about it, but I'm like, you know what? I don't want to go. So I'm not going to go. Right. Um, or I just don't want to have lunch with this person. So I'm not going to do it and I'm not going to make an excuse. I'm just going to say no. Right. So I've been working on saying no and just really focusing on what brings meaning to my life and not everything does. Yeah. Um, can we talk about death now? Thank you guys so much for listening to this week's episode of Good People. If you guys are watching on YouTube, please like, comment, and subscribe, and turn on notifications so you don't miss next week's episode. If you really enjoyed it, please share it with somebody that you love, perhaps your grandma. We'll see you next time.